I'm Terry David Mulligan, and this is Mulligan Sue CKUA Radio and Mulligan Sue the Podcast, Music, Film, Food, and Wine. Tammy Nielsen, I have been trying to find you. <laughs> I've been trying to find you for, for a couple of weeks, but frankly, for a couple of minutes here because uh, Zoom didn't want to do the Zoom thing. Um, <laughs> have you, uh, how, tell me about the first uh, three months of, uh, the six months of this year. How are you doing? Oh, if, if, ever, if ever there was a place to be in this world, it would be New Zealand. Yes, at the moment, uh, we're very lucky. It's, it feels very surreal. I, I feel like, um, at, at, you know, on one side, I feel like I have survivor's guilt because we're kind of back to business as usual. Um, sure. You know, the kids are back at school. Everyone's working. We're touring. We can't obviously go outside of um, our borders, our borders are closed, but um, we're currently at um, uh, level four, it's called, or sorry, <laughs> that's lockdown. Um, we're currently at, at level, uh, level one. And oh. so, um, does it, does it feel normal? It, it feels completely normal um, until you, you know, kind of, I think you can get quite complacent and you do kind of, it feels normal except for the fact that you feel a bit like isosceles you know there's a there's a sword mm. hanging over your head and at any moment it could drop you know especially seeing i mean a couple of weeks ago we were talking about opening a trans tasman bubble and having australia and uh being able to go between the two countries sure. um and then within a week uh they had a huge outbreak in victoria now they're getting you know, 60 cases a day and, um, or hundreds of cases a day now um, in, in Melbourne. And so it just shows you how quickly this can change. Um, and I mean, it, it already did once. We were in a very severe lockdown for um, a couple months where we could not leave the house except to, you know, uh, we could go outside to exercise away supplies. from people and supplies. We had to nominate one person in the family. So I didn't get to go. It was my husband. Um, he was an essential worker. So he was, I was still home with the kids, uh, 24 seven and he was still going to work. Um, mm. and so it was, a. I I mean, we couldn't even get mail. Like everything was shut down completely, but I mean, thanks to our leadership, that means that, you know, we went really extreme, really early. And uh, obviously the benefit of being and, in- And had a plan, they had a plan. They did. I mean, as much as you can have a plan right now for anybody, but um, hmm. so we're, we're very lucky, but I'm very keenly aware of um, the fact that it could change at the drop of a hat. And, and our leadership is even saying, you know, it's community transmission is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and when. so, yeah, they know it's going to. And there's happen there's again. no sign of no sign of performances, no sign of space where you could play. Seriously? Well, actually, right now, as I said, within the borders of New Zealand, we're back to normal. So I'm currently in the midst of you know promoting a tour with a twelve piece mm -hmm. orchestra. We're going to be touring, um, doing three shows around New Zealand and some big, beautiful theaters and. It and and it just feels surreal, you know. It's um, part part of you is like, do I remember how to do this? And the other part yeah, of we're you born is, to do this. <laughs> we're born to do it. It's like riding a bike, right? You don't forget this stuff. <laughs> it's in but your it, DNA. I I think though it will be very strange to walk out onto a stage and see thousands of people sitting in the audience together, you know, no. and yeah. But so uh, very, very grateful, but also very aware that you can't be complacent with this virus. Would you give me the quick um, uh, rundown uh, for the audience here? Uh, some of whom remember your family, the Nielsen family touring uh, across Canada. Um, how long were you together? Was it 10 years? Yeah, at least it would be at least a decade that we were actually traveling and performing professionally. And yeah. who are you sharing stages with at the time that would help people understand the, the time? Uh, well, we, I, I remember, gosh, I guess around your area, we were playing the Merritt Mountain Music Festival. 
and That's right. got to perform an open for Johnny Cash at that time. Is that um, where you burned your pajamas? That's where I, <laughs> that's where we were, yeah, driving on our way to the gig and our motorhome <laughs> caught fire and yeah. everything. And I was in my pajamas because we had just left a gig and you change into a pajamas to travel to the next place. And, um, and, and our motorhome caught fire. And so everything was lost except, thank God, our instruments were all packed underneath. So in, they were in a separate compartment. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we had to kind of, you know, roll up to the festival in pajamas and they gave me, um, a, you know, they gave us all festival t-shirts. So we, you know, okay. we matched, it was very stylish. <laughs> um, now, now it's fair to say, and I realize that there's a lot of, uh, time spent there, but I want to get onto the music and, and, but I wanted to remind people of your history uh, with Canada and with music in general, because you grew up on stage, you, mm -hmm. you know, you, when, when, during the sound check, you might be sitting in the front row watching your, your dad uh, work the, the vocals and every, everything else. And, um, and so now you have two sons of your own. I do. Do, do they go to gigs? Are they, have you traded places with them? Are you now on stage and they're <laughs> out there watching you play? Yeah, I guess I have. I mean, um, I was performing from a really young age. They're not performing yet, but they're six and eight. So there's still time, but I'm very aware of making sure that, you know, it's something they want to do and that they're comfortable with. Yeah. Um, they don't want to be crack, drag kicking and screaming. No, no. And I mean, we weren't either. Um, you know, I was very shy at that age. I didn't want to be singing in front of anyone. Um, uh, you know, that, that age is kind of getting into those preteen years can be quite awkward. And when did that shyness go away? And was it an epiphany? Yeah, well, um, I guess... It really, you know, it's funny because I was always in this uh, kind of sheltered, protective family nest, you know? And so when we yep. would perform, I was always kind of under the umbrella of my parents and having my brothers on stage with me. So I was very comfortable on stage. It was, you know, my whole family was there. Um, but as I got older and, you know, my dad used to have to say, I I really want you to introduce a song. Like I was happy to yeah. sing, but I was so shy, you know, when it came to talking to an audience, which, you know, people can't believe now. Um, but, you know, <laughs> we all grow and, uh, and, but I was kind of in this little, I don't know, like a little greenhouse being able to kind of thrive and grow and be nurtured. Sure. And it wasn't really until I moved to New Zealand, I had to move to the other side of the world and I didn't have, that safety net. I didn't have my family with me and I had to carry the show and do all the things I watched my dad do his whole life. So you, you had all of those years behind you and all of that stage time behind you. You literally started from scratch, from the starting line again. Yeah. You could tell them <laughs> you were a performer, that you had songs, but every time that somebody was looking, you had to audition all, all, all over again. But the yeah. deal is, what they didn't know is you had the goods. <laughs> well, I had that foundation, that really strong foundation and experience. And I mean, that definitely, I think, helps fast track anyone who's starting over in a new place is if you have that solid foundation. Uh, it, begs the it begs the question, how long did it take you to find your voice, your character, who you wanted to be and what you wanted to sing? That probably, um, I guess within the first five years, I, it was really wow. when I, you know, I had to start, I didn't know anyone here. I didn't even know like the bare, you know, when, when you kind of have this foundation in the music business, normally you, you don't realize all the things you kind of build up in your arsenal. You have, you know, venues, you know, venue owners, you know, promoters, you know, you know, it's sure. this whole community and network. And then you go to a new country and none of that is there to fall back on. I didn't know venues. I did. I remember going downtown and walking around looking at posters and writing down 
the names of the venues and because I sure. didn't know the, the places, the towns, anything. And so it was did really. You, did you see anybody? Did you see anybody doing what what you were kind of wanting to do? Uh, rockabilly, no. uh, nothing that's okay. <laughs> Not within New Zealand. It, it's funny. New Zealand has a bit of a funny relationship with country music. Um, it kind of had this big heyday in the '80s where it was on primetime television, and but it was mostly Kiwis singing covers of American country songs. Um, yeah. It it was there wasn't a there was some, but there was not a lot of original uh, New Zealand country music at the time. And then you know it had its heyday, and then it kind of skipped this generation, and people viewed it as well. That's my grandparents' music. Um, or that's my parents' music, you know? And, and so even, even to this day, you know, when you have a, like a news feature or you do an interview, the media here always is like, oh, let's put you on a hay bale. And, uh, you know, and they want to they like, they kind of want to make it funny. And, and it's like, well, th- you know, this isn't like an episode of Hee Haw. <laughs> this is like <laughs> my career. Um, and I'm not really that kind of country music, but, um, yeah, so it it it's it, it was kind of battling this preconceived notion of what they viewed country music as. All right, so it it would lead to then me playing Queenie Queenie because first of all I love the song. I just Thank dig the you. hell out of the song. Um, they won't play a lady on country radio. How many times have we heard those words? Mm. I mean, country radio is uh, it, well, the music business is male driven. It's mm. taken forever for women to be empowered. There's always been, tell me why, there's always been somebody out there. And uh, um, there's, um, I fall to pieces and sweet dreams and all that stuff. But they were, they were hard. Every one of those women worked hard to get where they were. Nobody handed them anything. Uh, And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering, did you have to break down those same barriers along the way? I think that, um, you know, as, as a female in the music business, I think every female who's in the music business has to work. We're kind of like the Ginger Rogers, you know, when they always say, um, you know, Fred Astaire, you know, everyone talks about him, but Ginger Rogers had to do everything backwards and in, and in, everything backwards. <laughs> you know, right. so she had a much That's harder right. job and mm-hmm. smile the whole time and look, you know, pristine and don't break a sweat. But, um, it, it is true in, in such a male dominated industry that you have to work twice as hard just to get to the start line. You know, that's, that's not even talking about getting into the race, just to get yeah. to that start, that starting position. And, uh, and so, you know, but because I kind of grew up in that um, situation where I had males, you know, my dad, my brothers were always with me in music. It wasn't until I moved to New Zealand that I really had to kind of confront it as a solo female artist without kind of those male avatars to uh, shield me from, from that. And, um, and you'll find that artists like Tammy Wynette or Loretta Lynn or, you know, so many of the artists that we love, Kitty Wells, you know, the first female artist who had a hit in country music, most of them traveled with their husbands or with their brothers or with their family, you know, that's how it was done. That's how you could get a foot into the industry because you had a male knocking down the doors for you. And so now, you know, coming to New Zealand and starting from scratch, um, of course, you know, you still run into that really, that really old mentality, but I had never really confronted uh, sexism and, and misogyny as hard as when I became a mother and Mm. dared to still think I could be a musician. You know, it was very much so many comments and judgments of putting me in my place. Like, don't you realize this is you now? You are a mother. That means you have to give up everything else. And how dare you think that you can still tour? And how dare you think that your husband has equal responsibility to you? (laughs) You know, I had never kind of, uh, conf- you've been confronted with it as much as, as, as when I became a mother. Yeah. Can I play a little Queenie? Queenie Queenie? Go for it. All right. Queenie Queenie from Chickaboom. Tammy Nielsen. This is Mulligan Stew, CKUA Radio, the Mulligan Stew podcast. We're going to play some tracks um, uh, on both the podcast and the show because they deserve to be played, damn it. Um, 
Tammy Nielsen uh, is with me. Finally, after we got Zoomed, uh, and, you, and you saved the day by recording on your end. Thank you so much. Um, uh, there's a lot of tracks I want to play off Chicka Boom, but uh, kind of like I was uh, taken by Sister Mavis simply because it was about Mavis Staples and about sisterhood. Mm. Um, and I think you had crossed paths with her there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I've had the. Was, this, was the song written as a result of meeting her? Yeah. I mean, I've Mavis has always been one of my or probably the biggest musical hero for me. Um, and I had the honor of getting to open for her twice. Um, mm. And the second time that I opened for her, I was in the midst of writing the new album. And I, uh, yeah, I, I was, I actually wrote it um, before I opened for her. And the very first time, it wasn't recorded yet, the very first time I played it was to open for her. So that's, that was pretty, <laughs> that was pretty special, like to kind of be able to sing this little um, song of tribute and, and love and, and admiration. Um, and I, I actually really hesitated at first. I kind of thought, do I put this on the album? Is it too fangirl? You know, is it, is it too much? And, but I've kind of, um, I have a bit of a history of, of, writing songs for women that inspire me and you know I, I wrote a song called Sister Cash for Johnny Cash's sister Joanne yeah. um, I did a duet with her on my first album and then on my last album I did a song about Sharon Jones of Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings called Miss Jones and so this for this album I thought you know I, I think it's really important because we don't have enough songs we have a lot of songs of, of, of men name checking their heroes you know, um, there's, there's so many, especially country songs and you'll find it yeah. really dominant in hip hop as well. Um, where men kind of drop these names of, of their heroes. And so I thought we don't have enough of women uplifting other women and singing about their love and their admiration for the women that have been their heroes. And so I kind of got over my, my fangirl cringe and I <laughs> thought, yeah. It's got to be on the album. And uh, so that's, that's how Sister Mavis got on there. Sister Mavis from Chickaboom, Tammy Nielsen, Molly Can Stew. That's Sister Mavis, Tammy Nielsen from the album Chickaboom, an album that she was right about now would have been world touring, <laughs> except for the pandemic. You can only hope that 2021 will bring some answers to some hard ass questions about when can we return to a sense of normalcy? We may never, who knows what performing, what playing is going to look like. Um, we know that we can still record. We know that we can stream online, but being the hot and sweaty clubs, I don't know if we'll ever do hot and sweaty again. I know it's, um, it's, it's something that, I mean, it, it's so unknown, but um, definitely something you have to grieve. I mean, in, in my case, it was, you know, beginning of the year, all the reviews were rolling in and, <laughs> and I still have like this quote that now just makes me cringe and laugh and cry all at the same time. Um, one of the, I think it was no depression that said 2020, the year of Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can safely say that didn't age well. Um, <laughs> but you, you know, you, you work your whole life. I was talking to a fellow musician yesterday about this. You work your whole life to build this momentum. And it's just yep. this, it's this slow and steady and grind and this pushing of this huge, heavy rock, you know, and, and you, you can feel when momentum starts to pick up and you're like, this is actually yes. happening. Yes. This is it. Oh, and I felt it. Yeah. And, and, and like the beginning of this year, I was experiencing things I'd never experienced as an artist that I'd always kind of dreamed of experiencing, you know, having people who are influential and having Rolling Stone rave reviews, you know, all of these things that you think this is, this is going to happen. Like this, this is going to be the album. 
and um and it and, and on the release everybody's raving about it and literally that was february two weeks later it disappeared overnight like it just the bottom fell out and i said to my brother it feels like we've been building this sand castle our whole lives and one wave just washed it all away oh, okay let, just let me give you a, a, an outside perspective you didn't ask for it i'm going to give it to you anyway <laughs> this this album will stand the test of time we will be playing this album for a long time to come. It'll all work out. It's all going to work out for you because this is the this is the game right here, right Thank here. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is you spiking the ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That I really appreciate that. And uh, that's that's the thing that gets you through is hearing, you know, uh, when you're when you're sitting at home and all the little notifications come up on your calendar of where you were supposed to be touring and who were, you were supposed to be playing with. Um, you know, when I was supposed to play Willie Nelson's Ranch yeah. on stage with Chris Christopherson. That one hurts. <laughs> that notification hurt when it popped up on the calendar. Um, but, you know, the, the thing that keeps you going is, is people getting in touch and saying, your album's getting me through this pandemic. Your, your music is, is bringing joy in the midst of all of this darkness. And, and that is the whole reason we do it as musicians. And I think that this has really brought that perspective and focus back to you know, I think when you're an artist such as myself, especially one that's, you know, spent a lot of building career as a self-managed artist until I sure. um, then signed with Outside Music there in Canada, um, it's very hard to separate the creative from the business because it's just, it goes hand in hand. It's a necessary evil of what you do. You know, it, you're, you're writing an album and you're already thinking of the press release and the rollout and the tour and so because you're wearing all these hats and all of it's sure. needing to be planned it's all and got your name on it it's all got your name on it exactly and so it's kind of this it's not just writing an album it's getting ready for a an entire cycle for the next couple of years sure and um and so to kind of separate those two i think has been really healthy um, my brother and I were talking about it, you know, we've talked a lot through this cause he was heavily involved. I wrote this album specifically to perform with him and tour the world with him. And of course he's sure. in Canada, I'm here. Who knows when we're going to get to see each other again. And, um, and we were chatting and he said, think about it. Like if you were to write an album and create it just for you and know that no one else was going to hear it, would you still create it? Mm -hmm. I said, well, of course I would like that's it's I have to and he said well just focus on the love of creating then like you have to take these baby steps and just focus on the creating and then try to separate the next steps you know did you ask him if he'd work for scale <laughs> he's my brother why do you think I work with him <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you well. One of the reasons why you work with him is because if he's doing the harmonies, he's doing the harmonies, right? He is. There you go. It shows up in the harmonies. Look, you can't. There, are, I've done specials on, on families that sing together and play together. There is something in the strength of a family that is unexplained. You just, they don't think about it. No. They just do it, right? Because yeah. they've been it's, doing it. It's in the roots. So singing with your brother, it's. Yeah, Fantastic. it's just like hardwired in your DNA. Nothing can compare to, you know, singing with someone you shared a womb with. <laughs> Not a room, a womb. And, um, and, and that silent, like there is no, I don't even know if you'd call it silent communication. It's just this body and brain and everything. Um, it, it's so naturally happens where the blend and knowing where the other person's going to go. I mean, it's being on stage with someone from the time you're, you know, seven years old. Give me an example off the album. Uh, I guess one of my 
favorite songs because we sing harmony all the way through um would be any fool with a heart yeah that's that's a that's a song you really you kind of lose who's singing what we kind of just become this one voice which i really love. sure well, let's play the dang thing do it <laughs> Tammy Nielsen, Tammy Nielsen is my guest. I'm Trevor David Mulligan. This is Mulligan Stu, CKUA Radio, and the podcast. So that, yes, she can listen and watch in New Zealand. Are you in Auckland? I'm in Auckland, yes. What a, it's a great hang, that place. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's a great place. It's a great place. Um, have you uh, availed yourself of New Zealand wines? I am not a wine drinker, which is just Get absolute. Out of here. I know. No. What a waste. <laughs> Like, the headphones came off and everything it's a complete travesty that i live in new zealand and i'm not a wine drinker <laughs> they have like some of the most renowned wines in the world oh my you are surrounded <laughs> by the greatness oh, oh my god now you're just like forget it this interview's over <laughs> I, said, forget it. No, I do a, i do a food and wine show i thought oh she'll tell me about it never mind never mind, never mind. Please forgive me. Uh, uh, you've, you've, I was looking back at your earlier albums. I got up to speed with uh, uh, Dynamite and then Don't Be Afraid and now Chickaboom. Um, there's two tracks I just want to finish with here. Uh, and uh, frankly, you would probably finish your shows with them anyway. Uh, the First Man was for your dad. But on this album, You Were Mine. It was for the memory of your dad and what he gave you and uh, all the days of his life that he gave you. Um, have you come to grips with the grief of losing your father? I don't think you ever do. I think, you know, with the grief, someone gave a really great analogy of, uh, you know, um, to me when I was going through that, you know, raw, immediate grief when we first lost him and they said you know grief is like a, a little cup inside of you and at first it just it gets filled and it's over it overflows it overflows it everything makes it overflow and then you start to kind of be able to function again and but your little things are still filling that cup and every once in a while it could be weeks it could be a month it could be years it's still filling quietly and then it, the smallest thing can make it overflow again, you know? So it's never gone. It's always there. You just kind of learn to function with kind of this gaping hole, you know? Um, it's, but, but nothing ever, your, your life kind of grows bigger around that hole, but um, it, it never gets filled and, and it, it never uh, goes away. You shot a video for it. Mm. And was it was it Todd, was it Todd your brother? That My other brother Todd, yeah. So Todd um, has a, a creative ag agency called Valiant Creative, and he does all of my visuals. He does you know my album covers, my music videos. So it's we're still you know still family business, even <laughs> even if he's not playing with me. Um, he's still very involved in in the creative side of all of my visuals. So Did yeah, he move to scale. <laughs> he does very what we call in New Zealand mates rates. <laughs> um, I want to I want to play this song because um, it, it's the last one that should really set it up for you. Um, when you sing, you wear mine on stage live. Where do you go? Um, I mean. That song, you do have to end the show with it because once you've done it, that's, that's the end. You know, you kind of leave it all on the stage. Um, I, sometimes I can go fully into it mentally and thinking about dad, um, sure. but most of the time I can't do that because then you don't get through the song. So you kind of have to focus. I really, because of the song being quite vocally challenging um sure i try to focus on the technique i try to focus on i can i can convey that emotion that the song brings every time um but 
I can't go too deep into my into my brain because then sure. yeah like you mentioned the first man I I can't perform that song anymore it's one of those songs that I can't perform live it's just it's too hard I I did a tour immediately after he passed away where I performed it every night and every night it was like on the brink and so uh that's when I can't just kind of switch off and think of technique that it's a very quiet song with a lot of space and there's nowhere to hide <laughs> so uh yeah it's it's tricky with songs that you write that are from a really painful raw place last question i'll let you go uh, and that is uh, what part of you still is canadian <laughs> just like my ears my eye my my actually just my right eye <laughs> oh man it's you know i think that where you're from and where you're raised it it molds you it shapes you and makes you who you are and um you know there's without a shadow of, of a doubt when people meet me here in new zealand like i'm a canadian they they don't i mean the accent is obviously a dead giveaway but also just you know i'm kiwis and canadians can be quite similar in that we're you know we're polite we're you know, self-depreciating as compared to our neighbors next door in, you know, whether it be the U S or Australia who are known for being yes. more loud and yes. boisterous. Yes. Um, yes. But even at that, you know, Canadians are almost like in the, in that middle ground, because I think we, we've, we've had such a heavy uh, state's influence that, you know, we're, we're a bit more, we are louder. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's just me. <laughs> maybe it's not the Canadian thing. Maybe I'm just loud. Um, but I, I think there is definitely, you know, in New Zealand, it's very like, um, you have to be humble. You can't be too bold. Um, <laughs> whereas I definitely uh, come across, I think when people first met me, a lot of the, the comments were like, oh, who does she think she is? You know, and it's- The North think, American hustle. Yeah, it's the hustle. It's that the like, hustle. it's the- But confidence. you were there to hustle. That's Nobody thing. was gonna hustle for you. You had to do the hustle. Yeah. I, 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 I have one last question, because I know I'm gonna lose you here. Um, uh, oh man. Do you know, down the road, Will you, will the persona change? Will the look of you change? Will I'm you evolve? I mean, when you look at the stuff I I did, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, like I'm ever evolving. I mean, everyone is. I think that an artist, in order to be true to yourself, yeah. you have to, you know, that integrity lies with changing with your personal inner self so if i was trying to be the same person i was 10 years ago it would come across it would ring untrue and i think the same would be said for now you know i'm in a place where i'm i'm more emboldened i'm more confident in who i am as a person in my um the way of thinking in challenging you know inequality or um being bold about you know strutting my stuff and and not being afraid, you know, there's no, no fear of judgment. And I think that I couldn't, you know, I wasn't like, I wasn't like that in my twenties. Were any of us like that in our twenties, you know? And I, I like to think that if I'm this bold now, I'm going to be like intolerable when I'm 60. <laughs> no one's going to be safe. Nobody's going to be safe. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to play Chicka Boom until the live uh, at the Ryman album comes out. Okay. Oh, no, good. man. Hey, if that album comes out, we'll be doing an interview and you can tell me <laughs> I told you so. That's my bucket list. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Terry.